Humans have a love-hate relationship with change. We need it for growth and variety, and yet we hate the upheaval it brings into our lives. Resilience seems to be the answer. So let's explore a new kind of conversation where we look at the turbulence of change and the resilience that enables us to not only survive it, but to truly thrive from it. I'm Paula Shaw, life transition expert, grief counseling specialist, and author. I'll be spotlighting influential people on this podcast, people who have taken the steps to change it up. So join us as we share valuable information to help you navigate the rocky waters of change. Come on, jump on in. Welcome to Change It Up Radio. For many of you, I should say welcome back to Change It Up Radio. We've been on a bit of a hiatus and we made some changes. One of them, if some of you are watching us on one of the live stream channels, you'll see that we're now live streaming onto Roku TV, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and Android TV, as well as YouTube and Facebook on our Change It Up radio pages. So we're coming to you on many levels now. And we're coming to you with, well, at least for me, a fresh perspective. And that perspective is that I've decided to kind of come out about something I've been a little bit underground about. And that is the fact that I am a grief expert. Grief is the core of, of what I work with, what I try to help people through. I've written two books about grief. I written grief. When will this? I never can get that angle quite right for the camera. <laughs> grief. When will this pain ever end? And this little guidebook. What's saying the right thing when you don't know what to say? So I wrote those books because I know that grief is such a huge issue. And right now it is a huge global issue, isn't it? And yet just because we all experience it doesn't mean that we really know what to do with it how or how to help someone else who is experiencing it. So I've decided that this spring season on Change It Up Radio, our theme is going to be a season of grief. And every show will be focused on someone or some group or something where loss was experienced and then they found a way through, a way to overcome, a way back. So we've got some fun shows coming up next week. NF, former NFL player Gary Plummer, whose life was severely impacted with traumatic brain injury. He'll be talking to us about what he did and how he found his way back. Down the road, we'll be having Deputy District Attorney here in San Diego, Tracy Pryor, who will be talking to us about One Safe Place, an amazing facility where abused children, abused elders, and people who have experienced human trafficking are sheltered. Are, well, they don't live there. It's not residential, but all the services they need are provided there. So, and Jenna Mendez, who works in a school district here in Southern California will be talking to us about foster children because she is the head of that program. So, oh my goodness, we've got so many wonderful people that are going to be talking to us and helping us all to learn more about this journey of grief. And that's what I really want to get into today because I realize so many of us really don't clearly understand what grief is, or for sure, we're not sure what to do with it once we have it. And I'll tell you, I spent some time during this hiatus listening to a podcast that Anderson Cooper did called All There Is. And that was one of the, that was one of my wake up calls when I realized how many people tuned into that show 
how quickly they grasped the content and wanted more because there are many, many hurting people out there. So today is going to be a kind of a master class. I don't have a guest. We're just going to dig down in there and start looking at grief. Every angle of grief, all the who, what, where's and why's of it. So that at the end of this show, I hope we can all be better informed about what it is, about what we can do when we're there ourselves or if we're trying to help someone else. And how do we go forward? What are the best tools and things we can do to help ourselves? So let's get into it. First of all, let me ask you a question. What is grief? I'm sure some of you are going to say, well, it's, it's tears, it's mourning, it's horrible sadness after somebody dies. And the answer is yes. Some of you are going to say it's depression, it's loneliness, it's anxiety after some major change in your life happens, like a breakup or a job loss or a terrible diagnosis from your doctor. And the answer is yes. Some of you are going to say it, it's panic, it's fear, it's anger, it's all these, these huge emotions that happen after something shocking has turned your life upside down. And the answer to that is yes. Grief is all of those things, all of those things. So many of us think grief is just about death, that you know, as soon as I say the word, you imagine people wearing black and I was going to say with armbands on, but that's kind of an old concept. But some of you who are my age out there, you remember there was even a time you wore an armband. So people understood you were grieving. And it, there are some, some things about that I think are actually pretty great because wouldn't it be great to be able to have just a little small badge on or a little something that lets people know I'm hurting. I'm not my usual self. But we don't have that now. So what ends up happening is when people are grieving, they really have a tough time. Because first of all, they don't want to bum everybody else out by talking about their pain and their sadness. And everybody else is kind of dancing around them because they don't want to make them hurt anymore. And so it ends up being a, a situation where we're not talking about what we're feeling. We're not honestly and authentically expressing ourselves. And I want to be really clear. Grief is the normal, natural response to any significant loss. That could be a death. It could be a job loss. It could be a bad health diagnosis. It could be the ending of a relationship or even a move. You know, even getting married, even though we choose that, it can be a grief experience on some levels because there's loss, isn't there? You no longer have your free single life the way you were living it now you have to live with consideration for someone else and that creates change. So let's get the, the chain straight. First, there's loss. That creates change. Change creates grief. Because, and this is what we say at the beginning of every show, <clears throat> even though we need change, we hate the discomfort of the unfamiliar. We hate it when it doesn't feel like the usual comfy, cozy thing that we're used to. And when that goes on, we have a tough time. We feel disoriented. We feel, I don't know, kind of weird. You know, we, we just, everything's not normal. It's not the way it was. And that leaves us feeling a bit disoriented. And sometimes it's even worse than that. We're just flat out feeling awful. We, we, we just don't, uh, we don't feel like we like to feel like when we're on our game, when we're feeling strong and feeling good. 
So let's look at how does grief come? In what sort of packages does it arrive? There's an author named Barry Davenport who talks about grief in two major groups, the slow growers and the surprise attackers. <laughs> so let's look at the slow growers first. That would be something like menopause. It's coming on. It's making changes. There's nothing you can do about it. There's a kind of upheaval, right? But it's subtle. Puberty is another one of those experiences. Change. Things aren't like they were exactly. New stuff is happening, and I don't know exactly how I feel about it. Empty nesting. Oh, boy, that's one I remember very well. It's like one day you're running around in three different directions, cooking and running kids to school and doing this and doing that. And all of a sudden, it's just you. You're the only one in the house. And it's a real huge adjustment. And it, and it gets doubled down upon when those children who not only are gone now, but they're not just at the next town over at the university. No, now they move to the other side of the country to university or a job takes them somewhere far away. All of those can be difficult to adjust to in those kind of slow growing, painful experiences. Then there's the surprise attackers. That could be like a natural disaster, which, boy, we've seen plenty of that this year, haven't we? Somebody living on their boat and suddenly a hurricane comes and that boat doesn't even exist. Uh, earthquakes, we've got those here in California. Fires, floods, all of those things that come out of nowhere and can really change your whole life experience like turn everything upside down. Same thing can happen with a car accident or, um, oh, what's another surprise? An affair. One day you think your life's fine and the next day that person that you're building your life with tells you that it's over, that they're focused on somebody else now. Those kind of experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, can really be the surprise attackers that the way I always look at it is it's like it turns your world upside down. And for creature loving, uh, for comfort loving creatures that we all are, as we were saying in the beginning, we like the coziness of the familiar. For those kinds of beings, which we are, when suddenly everything goes upside down, when the world that we were navigating in this kind of easy way doesn't look the same anymore, whew, that's tough. That's grief. All those experiences and all those emotions we've been discussing in this segment are all grief. They're all part of what happens to us emotionally when some significant loss causes change that turns our world upside down so that the familiar isn't even in sight. And when we get to that place, we're in grief. We're in grief. And that may look like wailing. It may look like panic. It may look like sobbing. It may look like inability to focus. It may look like Oh my goodness, so many things. It may look like just feeling distracted and, and, and feeling agitated, feeling anxious, being sleepless, having different kinds of physiological symptoms come up that we didn't even think about. It's all grief, guys. It's all grief. And that's what we're going to be looking at in a little more depth when we come back from this quick break. 
Is living in today's fast-paced world making you feel stressed and out of balance? Are anxiety, sleeplessness, depression, lack of focus, or weight gain robbing you of your relationship and your energy? If you're ready for change, you need to call Paula Shot. Paula helps you identify and eliminate self-sabotaging thinking and behavior. Using a wide variety of mind-body techniques, she provides her clients with the most effective processes for their specific needs. To book a session with Paula, call 858-480-9234. That's 858-480-9234. Welcome back. All right, now we're going to get into something that is really a pet peeve and a kind of a passion of mine. And that is talking about the five stages of grief. I know you've all heard about the five stages of grief, right? And I'm sure many of you believe there are five stages of grief. And you may have even been told that if you don't experience each stage, and if you don't have what you need in terms of healing that stage, that you can't heal your grief. So what I want to say loud and clear right here, right now, there are no five stages of grief. This is a misunderstanding that's been out there for years. And I'll tell you where it got started. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a book on death and dying. And she talked about the five stages of death and dying. So anger, denial, and, and all of those things that are part of the five stages are not necessarily what people experience when they're the ones left behind. These are the things experienced by people who find out that they are going to die. So please say it with me. <laughs> there are no five stages of grief. But what there are are dimensions or phases that many people experience in common. And I'd like to spend some time during this segment talking about those dimensions, because that is a place where many of us experience similar things. So let's start with shock, denial, numbness, disbelief. Most of the time when we experience a significant loss, it does begin with shock, right? It does begin with denial. Basically, like not denial that is, I don't think this is real, but denial like, I can't believe this could happen. I think back, one of the things that pops into my head right now was 9-11. <clears throat> Many of us here experienced 9-11. And I can remember when my daughter, I, like it was yesterday, I remember my daughter walking into my bedroom and saying, Mom, turn on the TV. And there it was. We've all seen it. The Twin Towers exploding and all of that that went on that day. That was shock, denial, numbness, disbelief, probably for all of us. The same thing might have happened to you at some point if someone called you and said, I'm so sorry, there's been a car accident. Or if you went into work or like one of my friends experienced just the day started, he thought it was a wonderful day and he worked for a great company and by text was informed that he was laid off. Those kinds of experiences are huge losses and they usually start with shock, denial, and disbelief, and even a kind of numbness. And then what happens after that, the next dimension that is often experienced, and remember, you don't have to experience all of these things. They're possible dimensions that you could experience. So the next one would be disorganization, confusion, and searching for meaning. You know, the why questions. Why, God, why would this happen? Why would it be, why would it occur for somebody who's just such a lovely person? The confusion, the disorientation that we can experience because we are a society of people 
who have been taught since we were small to lead with our brains, lead with our intellect and our thinking. And so when an experience happens where the heart has completely taken over because we're so emotional, we go immediately to our brain to try to make sense out of it. But let me tell you, I can tell you from my own experience and from my professional experience, the heart and the head don't necessarily meet on the same playing field. Sometimes you can't make sense out of it. Sometimes there are no answers to the why questions. There is no way to make it make sense. So then you might go into a dimension that's called anxiety, panic, fear. Again, if we go back to 9-11, once we couldn't make any sense out of what was going on, what was the next thing? Ah, what's going on? Oh my God, is it the end of the world? Anxiety, panic, fear often is a dimension that happens. Physiological changes can be a dimension that people often experience. And one of the most common, I think we've all experienced, is sleeplessness or inability to eat or inability to stop eating. You know, we find ways to cope with this craziness that we're experiencing with this upheaval. And sometimes the ways we find are not the most productive. And sometimes we end up with physical symptoms like headache, tension, um, so many things that can cause us to have a difficult time functioning physically. And let me say one thing about the physical aspect of grief right here. Grief is very physical. It is not uncommon for grievers to feel exhausted, exhausted, and then not be able to sleep. It's not uncommon for them to just feel a sense of uh, paralyzation, you know, like they just don't have the energy or the interest to be able to even move and, and get back into life on any level. So there are some very, very physical things that can happen with us, particularly in those early stages. Oop. Oh my God. I said the word stages, <laughs> shame on me, in those early dimensions of the grief experience. So one of the ones that often comes up, another dimension, not a stage, but a dimension, is having explosive emotions, feeling anger or rage even, or just irritated, you know, those kinds of emotions often occur and can be very, very difficult for people to work through. And you know what I always say to my grieving clients, all sorts of emotions are going to come up and it's very important to express those emotions because an emotion is energy in motion. And if you don't move it out it develops a little life of its own and it can wreak havoc inside. So pushing down your emotions and putting on the I'm fine face, no, 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 never a good idea. Now, I realize that it's a real world and many of us have to try to function in it even when we're grieving. And so we can't just break down in tears in the middle of the board meeting or you know, in the middle of dinner with our children sometimes. Sometimes that's okay, actually, because it's showing your children real emotion and that it's okay to express real emotion. But let's say you're in this dimension where you're experiencing explosive emotions. Is it okay to kick the dog and punch holes in the wall? No, of course not. But find a more productive way to still be able to express that emotion and move it out of your body. Go for a run, go for a bike ride, do some kickboxing. Pounding on pillows is one of my favorites because it doesn't require any equipment. <laughs> so 
take advantage of those kinds of opportunities. If you've got some good pillows, pound on those pillows, get it out. That's the whole idea. One of my favorites, and there may be some of you out there who have seen me driving down the freeway doing this. I'll often get in my car and just scream and rant and rave as I'm driving along, hopefully on the freeway where nobody's going to be exposed to me for very long. But it's another way of just getting it out. In my book, Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? There is actually a process I give you that I call the rant. And it's just that. It's just saying whatever you want to say and, and getting out all the pain and the anger and the frustration that can come with dealing with significant loss. So any process that helps you, whether it's going inside and being quiet and maybe meditating, or it's yoga, or it's jumping on that bike and going for an intense workout, whatever it is that helps you to move those intense emotions that you're feeling out, that's a really good thing, a really good thing. Now, there are also some other common experiences that people have when they're grieving. And that one of those is time distortion. Confusion is another one. There's something we call obsessive review which means you can't stop thinking about it over and over and over again. These are things that, again, you may experience or you may not. But that's these are common when people are in this, in this place, this grief place. A search for meaning is often experienced by many people. Just trying to figure out the whys, the what am I supposed to learn from this? Why would such a thing happen? Is there a way it could benefit humanity? That search for meaning can be very common. Another thing I want to talk about for a minute here is transitional objects, particularly if we're looking at death or maybe the empty nest. Keeping some of the things that belong to that person who's no longer in your life experience can be very helpful and soothing and healing. You know, knowing you can go get that jacket out and put it on and, and feel it again, or you can go pick up your child's favorite stuffed animal from when they were six and seven and not 18 and 19. Knowing you can connect with that and connect with the memories that go with it and the lovely moments that are attached those kinds of things can be very, very helpful. Another thing a lot of people experience is what I would call a grief attack or a memory embrace. And boy, those sneak up on you. They can come when you smell a certain smell or when you hear a certain song or you see a certain place. All of a sudden, you're flooded with memories of that relationship that you no longer have. And those can be really tricky and tough for people if they're not expecting the possibility of them. And most of the time we're not. But part of my goal here today is to give you a heads up about the kinds of things that can happen. So when they do, you'll know you're still okay. There's nothing wrong with you. Everything you're experiencing is normal and natural. All right, we'll do a little more exploring when we come back from this quick break. Paula Shaw here. I'm thrilled that LifeWave Phototherapy Patches, which use no drugs or chemicals, have become a part of my life and my business. My family and I all use their wearable patch technology and the results are life-changing. My parents in their 90s use the X39 patch, which activates stem cells, reverses aging, and improves the function of every area of the brain. I love X39 because I can work out with the 30-year-olds with no problem. And it's a 
laced my fine lines and given my skin a youthful glow. LifeWave patches use a patented form of phototherapy, frequencies of light, to safely boost health and wellness at the cellular level. No drugs. To learn more, go to my website, lifewave.com forward slash safe health. That's lifewave.com forward slash safe health. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio. We're talking about grief today, and we're talking about grief because, doggone it, there's so much of it out there, and it's one of those experiences in life that we can't escape. We're all going to experience it sooner or later. So my goal today is to give you the the ins and outs and the full picture of what grief can be and what it looks like so that when it shows up in your life, you'll feel a little bit more prepared or at least you'll know that what you're going through is normal and natural. So in our last segment, we were discussing some of the classic and and very common experiences that people can have when they're grieving. So let me start on this segment with a classic that so many of us have experienced, especially maybe at the holidays. And that is the memory attacks or the the grief that comes up during a certain anniversary, the holidays, a birthday, you know, that kind of thing where you have so many memories of how you spent time with that person who's no longer in your life. Another one that can really come up for a lot of people is sudden changes in mood. Just one minute you're feeling like, oh, yeah, everything's okay. And the next minute it's like, oh, and sometimes it's even physiological nausea or just feeling like, oh, there's a knot in your stomach. That's very common for people to experience when they're going through grief. This one is not so common, but I have worked with clients who have experienced it. And it's called physical identification symptoms with the person who is deceased. And this would be something like someone who whose loved one just passed and had Parkinson's might suddenly start experiencing a little shaking. Or someone who whose loved one had a heart problem could start experiencing chest pain. It, it's, as I said, not the most common thing, but I have seen it happen. And or people I, I've had clients who lost a loved one to a brain aneurysm and then suddenly started having headaches all the time. So I would caution anyone who starts having any kind of physiological symptoms. Go to your doctor right away. Let's make sure that it isn't something real. But then if if your doctor says no, actually on a physiological level, you're just fine. Then, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong here. You haven't just suddenly lost it. The truth is you're experiencing another one of these normal, natural grief experiences. Sometimes crying and sobbing out of nowhere is another Thing that we can experience that's very, very difficult. Drugs and alcohol, that's one that so many people fall into, especially because so often in the early days of your grief, people will say, why don't you have a drink to take the edge off it? Or doctors will give you sedatives. And that creates a mindset of, oh, this is what I need to do, not deal with what's happening and express the pain. What I should do is just subdue it with either drinking or drugs. Not a good idea, guys. You know, I always think drinking is great for celebration, but it's not really not helpful when you're sad It because it actually depresses the body the functioning of the body, it can make you more sad. So better to eat healthy food, get good sleep, 
um, exercise, talk with safe friends. Those are good, productive, helpful ways to deal with the pain and all of the agony and discomfort you're going through when you're grieving. So right now, I want to just kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about what I just touched on. What do you do with your grief? What do you do when you're smack in the middle of a grief experience and there's no turning back? Your world is upside down. That awful thing really did happen and life is never going to be exactly the same. And may I say that again, life is never going to be exactly the same, but that can be okay because if we handle our grief productively, on the other side, we're going to have more depth, more character, more compassion, more understanding. There will just be more of us to help others and to walk through the rest of our lives. But this idea that you want to get back to normal, you want life to be the way it was, it just really doesn't work that way. But the new normal can be even more wonderful than the old normal was. And you can be bringing to it so much more of who you are. So remember, change isn't always scary. It isn't always uncomfortable. But even when it is, it can still end up in some place that's really wonderful. And your life can be even better than it was before. So cry, moan, sob, rock, scream, pound on pillows, exercise, talk to safe people. These are all good things to do. Talk to a therapist. You know, just because we're all going to grieve doesn't mean we automatically know the right way to do it. Oh, and by the way, don't believe I said that. There is no right way. <laughs> I set myself up. Not on purpose, but I'm glad I did it. No, there is no correct etiquette for grieving. One more time, there is no right way to grieve. However, your grieving is what's right for you. There are no standards about how you grieve. Everybody grieves differently depending on how they were raised, the experiences they've had in the past, other losses they've experienced, uh, what their church had to say about grief, what their school had to say about it, what their parents had to say about it. All of these factors impact how we grieve. So is it even realistic to think we would all grieve the same way? Absolutely not. People who come from, from cultures that are more expressive, they may be just fine with sobbing, with yelling, with wailing. And other people who come from a place where stiff upper lip is more of what was practiced or being strong and, and not expressing pain, well, they're not going to be okay with sobbing and wailing and, and carrying on. And that's one of the reasons it can be tricky for us when we're trying to help each other when we're grieving. We'll get into that a little bit later. But some other things that can be really helpful when you're grieving. And by the way, in my book, The Grief, When Will Your Pain Ever End book, there are many of these tools and processes that you can look at, see what you resonate with, and then try doing that. But here's my suggestion. Make a commitment to yourself that every day you will do at least one thing, one thing to help you process your grief. That might be lighting a candle in the morning and saying a prayer. That might be just um, having a ritual of, of something you say that was special between you and the one who's lost. It might be going for one of my favorite things, 
a gratitude walk. Put on your tennies and get outside and breathe fresh air and just look around and make note of the things you can be grateful for. I'll tell you one of the things I'm very grateful for today is blue sky because we've had a lot of rain here in Southern California. But yes, on my walk this morning, I was grateful for blue sky, for fluffy white clouds, for clean air, for all the fragrances that there are in the air. A gratitude walk can shift your energy completely. It's a beautiful thing to do. There are many breathing practices that are really good for raising the level of your energy. I have several of them in the book. But many of you, especially if you do yoga and those kinds of things, you know other kinds of breathing methods that can be wonderful for oxygenating the brain, for shifting the energy of the body, and just helping you know that things can get better, that things will get better if you just keep that commitment to yourself. Each day, do one thing, one thing to help you get to a better place. Other tools I like to use are different energy modalities. Many of you know I'm a founding member of the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. And we do things like tapping on meridian points, working with the chakras, working with the biofield to help you shift what you're feeling emotionally and physically. And these processes can be very, very powerful for helping you move through your grief and not get stuck in it, becoming a monument to despair. We don't want that. That is the place where we don't heal. The place where we do heal is when we're taking steps each day to make ourselves a little bit better, a little bit different than we were the day before. Because one of the biggest problems when we're grieving is too often people get stuck in the grief. They get stuck with being that person who is their grieving identification. That might be the the grieving widow. It might be the girl who got left behind. It might be the parents who've lost their child. Whatever that is, remember, grief should be, and hopefully will be, a temporary situation. It's a journey we're moving through. It's not a place we want to arrive at and stay at. That's so important. And one of the things I really try to help people understand, we have the power to move through. We all do, every single one of us but it begins with intention. We have to have the intention to heal. We have to have the intention to get to the other side. And that's the place where we really begin. When you have the intention to heal, then it's so much easier to step into the kinds of behaviors that will really help you heal. So whether it's a nature walk or it's exercise or it's hanging out with children who are usually fun and funny or watching funny movies, uh, watching stand-up, that's okay. And, And may I say right here and now, it's okay to laugh when you're grieving. It's even wonderfully helpful to laugh when you're grieving. Sometimes I think we get caught up in thinking if we experience happiness, it's an act of disloyalty to the person who died or the person we've lost. But that's not true. We want to be experiencing our lives from the highest place always. And laughter is one of my favorite ways of getting to the highest level of energy that I can experience. So before we go to break, I just want to give you some things that I'd love to give you the heads up to avoid. Avoid the myths that are out there about grief, like time heals all wounds. No, action heals all wounds. Time can actually make it all worse. 
There are predictable stages of grief. That's another myth, and we've discussed that one very thoroughly. <laughs> it's best to get busy and just get back into life. No, it's best to be authentic and experience what you're really feeling. Don't put on the I'm fine face and stuff your feelings down. That's never, never a good thing. And the last myth I'll mention before we go to break is when you're dealing with a sad, grieving person, try to cheer them up and don't bring up the loss. No, that may be the worst thing you can do. We're going to talk about that some more when we come back from this break. See you in a minute. For those looking to improve their lives, there's nobody better to turn to than Paula Shaw. Paula helps people regain successful lives by identifying and eliminating self-sabotaging behavior using a multitude of mind-body techniques to identify and resolve their core issues. Working with a wide variety of healing modalities, she provides her clients with the most effective process for their specific needs. To book a session with Paula, call 858-480-9234. That's 858-480-9234. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio. We're talking about grief today because darn it, it's out there. And we're all going to experience it. So what we want to do is have some clues, some understanding of what the grief experience looks like so that when it's our turn, we won't be blown away. When it's our turn, we'll have some tools and some processes that can help us. So. In our last segment, we ended talking about this idea that it's helpful when somebody's grieving for you to cheer them up, cheer them up. Don't bring up the loss. Don't talk about their sad feelings. No. One of the things that I will never forget is when my best friend lost her pregnancy and I did all I could to cheer her up whenever we would speak. And finally, one day, like a month later, she said to me, I went back to work and nobody even mentioned it. Nobody talked about it. And I said, did you? And she said, no, I, I didn't want to bum everybody out. She said, but I couldn't believe nobody even said anything. And of course, I was feeling this agony, this knot in my stomach because I was one of those people. Back then, I wasn't a grief expert. I hadn't done the studying that I've done now. So I, like many of you probably thought, well, the best thing to do is to cheer her up, to, to distract her, take her somewhere fun or talk about something else. But the bottom line is, guys, your grief is the elephant in the middle of the living room. It's not like you don't know it's there. And it's not like you're not feeling the pain you're feeling. So bring it up. Talk to them about it. And, and let me say this. I know that most of you don't want to bring it up because you're afraid of, you don't know what to say. You're afraid that you'll make it worse. And you certainly don't want to hurt somebody you love and make them feel more pain. But the truth is, even if you say, listen, I know you're really hurting. And I, I don't even know exactly what to say. I don't know how to help you. But I just want you to know that I, I love you and I'm here. And, and I know that you're in pain. That can be a really helpful thing to say because you've acknowledged the truth of their reality. You don't have to be the, the Dalai Lama. You don't have to be an enlightened master to help someone who's hurting. Sometimes you can even just say, you know what? I don't know what to say, but can I give you a hug? Ah. Sometimes that's the best thing anybody can do for you, give you that hug. So I want to, in, in fact, one of the reasons I wrote this book, Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say, is because I 
had more clients say to me the words that my friend had said, nobody brought it up. And I knew why they didn't bring it up because I knew why I hadn't brought it up because I felt inadequate. I didn't know the right thing to do to help a mourner, you know, or to help somebody in pain. In fact, recently I saw something online and I think it was Larry David was doing kind of a comedy routine and he was going, none of us want to talk to the mourner. None of us want to talk to, we don't know what to say to the mourner. We don't know what to do with the mourner. And, and I thought, wow, you know, that should be like a little video on my book because it's so true. And when we're uncomfortable, the unfortunate thing is what we tend to do is nothing. Instead of taking that casserole to our hurting friend and saying, listen, I brought this to you because I know you're hurting and I love you, but I don't know how to talk about your pain with you. Instead of doing that, which would be great, we don't show up at all. Oh, we get busier. Oh, oh, I was, I meant to call, but we don't. And then we leave that person alone in their darkness, hurting. And that's the last thing we want to do because grievers don't heal very well alone. That's why there's such power in grief groups. That's why there's such power in talking to your safe friends or talking to a therapist because we need to get it out. Remember I said emotion, energy in motion inside needs to be released. And one of the best ways we do that is through conversation, because that allows us to explore what we're feeling, to express what we're feeling. And then through that, we get to understand it better. So being that person, that safe person that someone can express themselves to, oh, it's priceless. <laughs> it truly is priceless. And giving somebody that opportunity is huge. And one of the things I want to say right now to let you all off the hook, those of you who are worried that you don't know the right things to say, the best thing you can do is to listen. Ask questions that prompt conversation on the part of the griever and be a great listener. You don't have to have perfect answers. You don't have to know how to help them heal. Because if you listen, and I'm not just saying, you know, kind of cursory listening. I'm talking about deep listening. When you're engaged in deep listening, the energy shifts. The person can feel that you're with them and they can feel the safety of that listening. Think about it. Most of us are, instead of listening, we're planning the next thing we're going to say. Or even worse, we step on their lip and interrupt them and say the next thing we're going to say. Silence and listening create such a healing space. It's so powerful. But when you do speak, if you're engaged in one of those conversations with somebody who's grieving and sad, then what I strongly encourage you to do is come from, oop, I started to go to the wrong place. Let's start here. Do not come from your head. Come from your heart. What I love to say is that when people are hurting, they need your humanity, not your database. Come from your heart, even if it's just to say, oh my God, how awful. I'm hurting for you. I feel so sad. I'm so, so sorry you're experiencing this. That's actually really helpful. Really helpful. So remember to listen, to really be present and come into that conversation, not with the intention of fixing them or God help us cheering them up. No, 
come into that conversation with the intention of being supportive, compassionate, loving, being of service. Oh my gosh. If you step into the conversation with those goals, you can do so much more than you will. If you step into the conversation with the desire to teach, preach, change, or advise, that is not what a griever needs. No teaching, no preaching, no changing, no advising. Be there as a human being who understands human pain. Support them in that place where they are. And that will be giving them something truly, truly helpful. So I want to end this by discussing some things that you don't want to say and some things that you do. So the things that you don't want to say that will not be helpful, and by the way, any of you who are listening to this, if you go to my website, paulashaw.com, there is a free gift there called 20 Things to Say and Not to Say to People in, in Pain. And you can grab that free gift, and then you're going to have your own little cheat sheet to keep in your purse or your glove box or your briefcase so you can remind yourself when you're going into these difficult conversations, if you're about to arrive at the office and your best friend has just been fired, or if you are going to visit someone who just lost her mom, whatever the situation is, you can just check that list of what is helpful and what is not helpful. And you'll walk into that conversation so much better prepared. So some of the things that are helpful are what I have been describing to you. Statements that come from the heart and from humanity. Things like, oh my God, how awful. How are you coping? Oh, how can I help? I don't know if I could handle this if it were me. You seem to be doing great. What do you need? Is there something I can bring you? Remember, to say to a griever, Hey, I'm here if you need me. Just call. They're not going to call. They're more likely to go back to bed and pull the covers over their head. You need to reach out. Show up at the door with that casserole. Oh, I heard the most fabulous um, story on that podcast I mentioned to you of Anderson Cooper's called All There Is. And it was that a man had lost, the man they were interviewing was somebody of renown who lost his daughter, his young adult daughter. And his friend arrived with groceries and said, I'm not coming in. You don't have to talk to me or entertain me. I brought you some food. And I'm, I'm going to be sitting right here on the porch. So you'll just know that I'm here if you need me. And hopefully, so you'll just feel a little bit safer. That's one of the most beautiful things I ever heard of anybody doing for a hurting friend. Sometimes just sitting, putting their arm around them, giving them a hug, watching a movie together in silence, taking a walk in silence can be really helpful. But what isn't helpful when you come from your head and you say things like, well, at least he's out of pain or, hey, there are a million guys out there. You'll find another one or, well, God must have wanted him more than you did. Time heals all wounds. These kinds of things we've discussed today, we've all been we've all heard them, you know, because everybody's trying. You're at the funeral. Everybody's trying at the funeral to help everybody feel better. So often they end up saying things they've heard before that may not really be better or helpful. So I leave you with this. Come from your heart. Come from your humanity. When in doubt, don't go to your head. Come from your heart. It knows the way. 
Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for taking this look at grief with me. And I look forward to seeing you next week here on Change It Up Radio when we'll be joined by former NFL player Gary Plummer. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me on Change It Up Radio. I hope you found this episode informative and entertaining. If you want to hear past shows or you want to get information on being a guest or a sponsor of this show, go to changeitupradio.com. We all know that change is inevitable and it's necessary, but darn it, it's also tricky. My goal is to help you make the experience of change smoother and more productive. If you've benefited from this show, please subscribe to it, share it, and review it. That helps me to tune into what you really want to hear and what you really want to learn more about. Remember, you can find us on every major podcast platform and also on YouTube, Facebook, Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. We look forward to seeing you next week for Change It Up Radio.